today on a invasive plant management decision analysis tool. And we have taken the last two years approximately to develop this tool. We released the first version this past summer in June, so that's version 1.1. I'd like to first just recognize the other uh, people on the working group that de developed this tool, Marilyn Jordan, Greg Sargis, Hillary Smith, and Kathy Schweiger. So first I just want to uh, give you a general outline or summary of what I'm going to be talking about today. So first I just want to go over issues that a number of invasive plant managers face, that forecasting the success of invasive plant control is very complex. And we recognize this within the Nature Conservancy, and so that led to the development of the Invasive Plant Management Decision Analysis Tool. I'm going to be talking briefly about the structure of the tool and then applying it to a case study project. I'm also going to be talking about the benefits of the tool, how it leads to better, sounder decisions, and in turn will lead to a higher rate of project success, we believe. And then lastly, I want to talk about um, adopting the tool as a common standard in the invasive plant management field. So the um, decision tool was really born out of an internal debate that we had within the Nature Conservancy approximately three years ago when we were trying to determine how to move forward on controlling invasive species that were widespread within the Catskill region and had a high ecological impact. But we were un unclear about the long-term feasibility of those control actions given the limited funding that was available. At that point, we realized that we did not have a common set of criteria for which to evaluate invasive plant control projects and whether they should be implemented or not. And similarly, uh, approximately six months ago, there was a paper published by Davis et al. in Nature uh, entitled Don't Judge Species on Their Origins, and it really questions uh, questioned uh, the control projects, if they were warranted, and if they had a clear outcome. And so they particularly pointed out Tamarask, uh, controlling Tamarask in the southwest, if that was really a good control pro program. And that generated a fair amount of discussion within the Nature Conservancy between our science staff and land managers. Also, it's important to recognize that there is often a fair amount of uncertainty uh, within determining if there's ecological impact. Often we don't have um, good published um, information on ecological impact or potentially the um, success of control action. So it's really important to be able to document that. And that's an issue I think that a number of us face. There are some tools out there to rank the threat to biodiversity of particular invasive plants and also to prioritize their management. But those tools really are not sufficient to determine when not to engage or when to engage and look specifically at the feasibility of an, a particular action and long-term success. Then lastly, the uh, Nature Conservancy's planning evolution team evaluated our overall conservation planning process. And from that, they found some interesting um, correlations or similarities to what we found in reviewing the invasive plant literature. And that the strategies that we often employ are sometimes biased and uh, opportunistic. And rarely do we assess cost and benefit. So really to address these issues, um, the decision analysis tool was to develop, and we think that it really will resolve some of these um, challenges. The decision analysis tool has a comprehensive set of criteria. And first, the tool looks at, is the control action warranted? So we should we be doing control for this particular species. And this looks at, is there significant impact or harm to human health? And then secondly, there are a set of criteria centered around feasibility. And then lastly, um, the return on investment is uh, looked at. 
The decision tool allows for us to um, also look at these control projects ob objectively. And this is particularly important when evaluating projects that are currently underway. So personally, as we look at projects that potentially are five years underway, land managers and invasive species managers often are very invested and have an emotional connection to these projects because they want them to succeed and we want to be able to conserve and protect the resources that we've worked so hard to abate the invasive species threat on. And sometimes it's hard um, to objectively evaluate whether a particular project would move forward. And we think the decision tool really addresses this. Also, it focuses our control strategies on clear conservation outcomes. And then lastly, it's a transparent process to document our decisions. Within the decision tool, there are a series of worksheets that the decisions are documented within. So each criteria has basically a, um, a um, box from which the decisions are documented and um, comments can be recorded. And then that is summarized within the um, cover sheet um, that can be shared with senior managers or other natural resource managers. And so the information is easily distributed among people and provides a common framework to do that. The tool is structured based on four decision trees. The first decision tree is a strategy selection decision tree. Once a strategy is selected, there are three potential control strategies that are in the decision tool. First being eradication, the second being containment exclusion, and then the third being suppression. We have defined these uh, different control strategies within the tool to make it very clear what our intentions are for each one of these. And so we define eradication as eliminating all individuals and the seed bank of a particular occurrence with the low likelihood of needing to address this species in the future um, in the project area. And we use a 10-year time frame to define eradication. The second way is containment or exclusion. And so that is preventing infestations from spreading into uninvaded areas. And then lastly is suppression. So this would be reducing the density or cover below a threshold to maintain a species or ecological process. So then I've put together just some simple maps to basically illustrate these different control strategy concepts. The first being eradication, which is on the left-hand side of the screen. The map depicts two occurrences which are shown by red dots um, on the map. One of the occurrences fall in uh, New York, and the other occurrences falls down in uh, Maryland. And so these are hypothetical um, invasive plant occurrences. So if we had this occurrence of this species and the control was warranted, um, if we were able to eliminate the occurrence within New York State, we could classify that, we believe, as an eradication effort and the species would be considered eradicated in New York. Whereas we define containment exclusion in the second map that you see there of the CRISP region or Catskill region. This is a map of <coughs> the distribution of mile a minute. At one point, uh, we where a report came in of Milo Minute in Sullivan County, which is in the CRISP region. Uh, we responded to that report and determined it was not Milo Minute. However, if it was, we would work to eliminate that occurrence. However, we would not classify that as a um, eradication effort within the CRISP region because there is a high likelihood that Milo a minute would reinvade the CRISP region within a 10-year time frame given its distribution and abundance in the Hudson Valley, as you see in Orange County. And then lastly, we have the <coughs> category of suppression. And so this picture here de depicts a um, high um, abundance and cover of black swallowwort. And so a potential land manager might want to suppress swallowwort within this area over a short period of time to recruit seedlings, for instance. And so that would be potentially a suppression technique. 
Are there any uh, clarifying questions about uh, the definitions that we've chosen? <coughs> Chris, uh, no, nothing on that right now. There is a question that popped up in the chat. Want to know if the decision tool was specifically for invasive plants only right now? <coughs> That's a good question, Toy. Troy. Initially, we had uh, looked to design the decision tool to be more general for other invasive uh, species, but because we wanted to make it as detailed as possible, we developed it primarily right now for invasive plants. Um, we would be interested in developing it, uh, developing it for pests and pathogens and other uh, aquatic invaders, potentially. Thanks, Troy. Okay, we're having a little difficulty here trying to uh, move forward. There we go. All right, sorry for the delay. So this is the uh, first decision tree within the tool. This is a strategy selection tree. And so the first question that uh, the invasive plant manager and team is faced with, is the control project warranted? And so is there ecological impact harm to human health or to other values, such as economic impact. And for the ecological impact, we tie this into the New York State Invasive Plant Ranking System. And so if the project, uh, if control is warranted, that goes to the second um, couplet of decisions and second criteria, which is based on the distribution and abundance of the invasive plant species. And we use three different uh, distribution criteria, limited, moderate, and widespread distribution. And the breakpoints between these classifications is based on a paper that was published in 2002 entitled, When is Eradication of an Exotic Pest Plant a Realistic Goal? And they found in that paper that invasive plant occurrences or populations that were less than 100 hectares in size had about a 35 percent 35% chance of being successful. And so we use that breakpoint of determining when a project should go through the eradication decision tree or where should it be moved to containment or potentially suppression. <coughs> this here is the second set of decision trees. As I mentioned, there are three different decision trees, one for each control category. This is the uh, containment decision tree. There are seven criteria within this decision tree, and these categories were basically identified and we selected them based on a number of publications on evaluating the feasibility of eradication. And the paper that was specifically very helpful was a paper published by Panetta and Timmons in 2004. There are three possible outcomes from the decision tree, one to proceed, stop, or peer review. Now I'm going <clears> to <throat> apply the decision tree to a specific case study in a specific pro project. We're going to be applying it retrospectively to a control project of Phragmites in intertidal dune swales in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And a colleague of mine, Karen Lombard, within the Massachusetts chapter of the Nature Conservancy applied this to her project. They worked on this project from 2002 to 2009. And this project took place in Cape Cod at the Sandy Neck Preserve. <coughs> and they were working to control Phragmites, which is invading these intertidal dune swales, which you see in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. These intertidal dune swales were recognized in ecoregional planning processes by the Nature Conservancy as globally significant ecological communities, so having a high conservation benefit. The first question that the project team asked, is control warranted? And there is quite a bit of information out there that they found and that I've also come across that Phragmites does significantly alter the composition, structure, and ecosystem processes within wetland systems. And this was the case within these intertidal dune systems. So they moved forward with the projects. 
In 2002, they looked at the distribution of Phragmites within this project area, and they had 51 swales that were invaded. Using the decision tool, this would lean you towards a containment or suppression effort. Uh, based on this information, we could not tease out whether it should be containment or suppression, but it was fairly clear that eradication was not feasible. So we ran the project through as a containment project. The next criteria was looking at the social political environment. So was social resistance uh, expected to the control effort? And so they didn't have any resistance to the uh, treatments of the Phragmites over the course of the project. And also, within the invaded area, do all the organizations or landowners agree to participate? And so the project area was centered in the Sandy Neck Preserve in the town of Barnstable. And the Nature Conservancy had a management agreement with the town to control the Phragmites. The next criteria within the containment uh, decision tree is asking, is the species difficult to detect? Is it hard to find? And so this was one criteria that I was surprised to find in the literature was one of the most important factors determining the success of eradication and containment efforts. So if a species is difficult to find, um, search time goes up as well as this highly influences the cost of the project. In this case, the Phragmites was fairly easy to detect in these intertidal dune swales. However, Phragmites could be considered difficult to find if you were working in a cattail marsh, for instance. <coughs> the next criteria was can reinvasion be prevented? In this situation, these intertidal dune swales were being invaded by Phragmites. Um, and Phragmites was being spread, and the rhizomes and seed and propagules were being spread by uh, hurricanes and other large tropical storms that had large storm surges, and that was spreading the Phragmites around. So by 2009, they were controlling approximately Phragmites in 90 swales, so that had increased over the course of the project. So reinvasion could not be prevented. So that led the team to really have to look at this as a suppression project that would need to be carried out over the long term in potentially perpetuity. However, they did have an effective control method to suppress the Phragmites. In 2008, they had 79% of the swales either had, that were treated either had no Phragmites or less than 50 Phragmite stems. And so you can see from the before and after control photos here that they were very effective in being able to suppress the Phragmites, but they were, again, having um, considerable reinvasion over the long term. Next, we asked project teams to evaluate project costs. And so they determined over the six-year period of time, retrospectively, that this project cost approximately $5,000 per year to implement. And so that fell into what we categorize as a low cost category. And so we've broken out different cost categories. Those cost categories then can be used to evaluate the return on investment. So on the left axis here you see cost. And then also on the bottom axis, you see conservation benefit. And this is just a very simple diagram to evaluate the return on investment. Um, our team recognizes that uh, evaluating cost benefit and return on investment is a very complex undertaking. But we wanted to provide a placeholder within the tool for invasive plant managers and senior managers to really look at this concept and evaluate it. So in this case, um, looking at the Phragmites control project, they had a relatively low cost and what they considered a high conservation benefit. Because this um, ecological community, the tidal swales were recognized as a ecoregional priority and a globally rare plant community. However, what they did find, even though this was a high cost benefit ratio at a high return on investment, 
that funding for core operations were not in place. So the question that we ask in the decision tool is funding for core operations secure for at least two years with a high likelihood of long-term sustainable funding. And this is very important for control efforts that are containment or suppression that will need to be carried out over the long term um, as compared to potentially eradication project that potentially would have a end date in sight. And so I would like to, as we go into the discussion, try to think about um, some solutions for long-term funding. And uh, endowments might be one solution as well as uh, mitigation banks. So in conclusion, looking at this case study, if there is not a long-term commitment um, by local managers at this site with a long-term uh, funding source, such as an endowment, um, it's likely that this project won't succeed and that this globally rare um, community type will become dominated by Phragmites over the long term. And so then now moving towards uh, next steps and recommendations. We are recommending this, uh, that the decision tool be adopted as a common standard for invasive plant project review. And so we think that it will increase the probability of success. So we think that there might be fewer invasive projects, but we think the projects that are implemented will have a higher rate of success. In completing the decision tool, we believe is a minor time commitment given the amount of money that can be saved over the long term. Based on our pilot control, our pilot run-throughs of the decision tool, if all the information is already assembled, it takes approximately two to three hours to get through the decision tool and document uh, a project. In New York, the Nature Conservancy is currently running 10 projects through the decision tool within the next four months. And we have a number of partners also that are um, running projects through the decision tool. And so we're going to be adapting the t decision tool over the next year and releasing a new version um, within 2012 as we learn about some of the potential issues and making the decision tool more user friendly. Also, we're currently working, and we're really excited about this, with IMAP to develop an online version of the tool. And so we think that this will facilitate um, making the tool much more easy to use. So lastly, where can you find the decision tool? Currently, it's posted on uh, Conserve Online, and also we're working to get the PDF and the active form for the decision tool posted on IMAP. It should be posted on the IMAP general website within two weeks. But it's probably simply you can just email me. My email address is on the screen, and I will send you a copy of the tool as well as a copy of the interactive form. And so I just wanted to say thanks uh, for this opportunity to speak to you about this really important topic and your attention. And I believe that maybe we have a few 